Excessive pride is often considered detrimental to great nations and empires, while pride can serve as a powerful motivator for rallying nations or empires during times of war and turmoil. If taken too far, it can lead to cracks and eventual decline. The Roman Empire serves as a prime example of this phenomenon. The Romans believed in their invisibility and their ability to conquer anything, but history ultimately proved them wrong when they were decimated by barbarian tribes and later faced challenges from Islam. A similar fate could befall America if it fails to moderate its sense of exceptionalism and invincibility. This refers to the notion that America can do anything without question imposing its own rule-based international order on others while brutally suppressing those who disagree with their modern practices. If this mindset persists without introspection, it may ultimately lead to America's downfall just as pride contributed to the decline of Rome. The video we're about to analyze encompasses a range of complex discussions that compelled me to reach a specific conclusion. It is crucial for Americans to consistently evaluate the actions of their government, particularly when it involves the destruction of other nations in response to a few individuals who pose a threat to national security. One example frequently cited by Americans is the events of 9-11 which marked a significant turning point. In the unity of the nation, it was regarded as a moment when the country came together to decisively confront Islam as a whole, as a religion, and combat terrorism specifically. However, some folks refer to the American military involvement in the Middle East as a crusade, evoking a somber historical connotation that ultimately hindered the success of the war on terror. Great crisis builds great response in the heart of any man. Yeah. After 9-11, you saw the unification of America in, in an amazing way. Because whenever you have a great crisis, you, you will inherently point back to a great tenet or a great truth. And what happened on 9-11, the great truth was nobody messes with the greatest country in the world and I'm part of that and I'm proud to be part of that and I'm coming together with my neighbors and I'm upset about this yep. and I'm healing together and I'm mourning together and I'm angry together. Together, the word together keeps coming. In the age of moral relativism, as we see here, everybody's truth is okay. So starting in 1968, 69, if you were to study that, there were about four things that came together that make it very understandable for a crack in the heart of the populace. Although I strongly denounce the tragic event of 9-11, I feel compelled to question the perspective of this individual. Does he realize the immense loss of innocent lives that occurred throughout the course of the war on terror? Is he aware that the unity he proudly proclaims led to the devastation of entire civilizations and nations? Examples of Libya and Iraq illustrate the far-reaching consequences of these actions. Assalamu alaikum, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Open Minded Thinker Show. Please like and share in charity to enable others see this amazing video. Don't forget to subscribe to enable us grow bigger and better. Which was his name before Muhammad Ali. Yes. Or Kareem Abdul Jabbar. We do. We actually got well, Kashi's play up there. Yeah. yeah the, the, the idea of. Men. Dave Chappelle, by the way. Yeah, Dave Chappelle. Is, is he a, is he a I Muslim? I believe so. Is that right? I didn't know that. Tyson. Um, what? Tyson. Tyson. Yeah, it, it, the idea, especially black men, being drawn to the Muslim faith is not new because it really does, it's unapologetic in the patriarchy, right? So in a hyper-feminist world, it seems attractive. And again, I mean, Malcolm mm. X wrote extensively about this. I, I mean, I don't subscribe to a lot of the appeal of it, because Islam is not true in my worldview, but that's we could discuss that. I don't think it's actually useful of our time today. But you're you're hitting on something really important, Patrick. In a world that has gone mad in chaos, people yearn for order. Now you could be too far in the order direction, which I think Islam goes too far. 
I do not want to live in a theocratic fascist country. I like have freedom of speech. I like having dialogue. I like private property rights. I like entrepreneurship. That's why I think the West is the best, because you balance order with spontaneity and unpredictability. If you just want order, you can live in Saudi Arabia, but that's not a free society. And But I think the West has gone way too far away from having order as a bedrock principle. What the founders tried to establish in the Constitution, especially because of the world that they built it in, is how do we have liberty, but also we have the rootedness of eternal wisdom so that liberty does not become licentiousness. And that's exactly what we're living through is that it's no longer the pursuit of what is good, it's the pursuit of what makes me feel good. And those are two different things. So people like Tate, or people previously in the 60s or 70s, I mean, you could list a lot of people that convert to Islam because it's very attractive because the strong man archetype is not just present in Islam, it is demanded in Islam. That the man is the not just the head of the home, the head of the society, and so it's very attractive in a world that's gone mad. I think that's the wrong answer, to be very, just to be clear, but I can understand why certain people would be gravitated towards so it. So who, who would you say today is the most famous non-pastor Christian in the world that's getting others to say, I also want to be a Christian? I, I don't mean Joel Osteen. I don't yeah. mean if you go to some of the big pastors that we have. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a guy that's in Hollywood, that's in the NBA, that's in the MLB, that's in music. Yep. Who are some of the biggest ones that are converting, that are converting? Yeah, I mean, I, maybe Tim Tebow, but he's not exactly as successful. But you're, you're pinpointing something really powerful here, which I totally agree with. First of all, if you find, I mean, Justin Bieber is not exactly someone I would consider theologically sound, right? But at least he says good things about Jesus. <laughs> but... The Christian world is lacking in the cultural figures that embrace the worldview, whereas in the 50s or 60s, you had John Wayne. Mm. You had every major act, not every, but you had Joe DiMaggio. You had, before that, Babe Ruth that were outspoken Christians. This response originated from a thought-provoking discussion on the PBD podcast where the presenter expressed curiosity about the messaging tactics of Islam that resonate with young Americans. There, there's some stats we looked at a couple months ago on a podcast. We had this guy that was talking about how the, the, you know, underpopulation is the problem, not overpopulation, yeah, how the world can handle it. You know, and then we looked up the numbers on the podcast and we saw, I'm, I'm going to be wrong by a couple percentage points, but pretty close within a couple percentage points. Out of 100 people that are born in the world, 33 were Christians, 31 were Muslims. But out of 100 people that die in the world, 32 were Christians, only 10 were Muslims. Which means the young, you know, Muslims are having more sure. kids and they're a lot younger, which means by 2035, the world will be led by Muslims, having more Muslims in the world than sure. Christians. And why do you think that message? Because a lot of times you see that message and all you think about is, well, the first thing we think about is, well, it's a Muslim extremist. I mean, every Muslim is a Muslim extremist, which is not. It's a smaller sect of uh, the majority. But if, if, the, if the messaging... What are they doing that their messaging is more attractive for NBA players, football players, Hollywood? Some sure, people yeah. are starting to say, well, I'm, I'm kind of going to lean towards this than Christianity today. Yeah, I don't the response he received resonated with me the most as it emphasized the, indom the indomitable qualities of Islam, particularly its emphasis on masculinity as a means to restore order amidst immoral turbulence afflicting the Western world today. The issue at hand appears to be centered around the challenge of how Christians can, you know, effectively regroup and make their religion more appealing to the increasingly disinterested younger generation popularly known as a Gen Z. However, the individuals in question engaged in a discussion that involved various ideas, including the suggestion of seeking popular personalities and celebrities who could promote the Christian message to their own audiences and potentially bring America back to the Judeo-Christian roots. I believe everything you're saying is accurate. I also think that there's sort of a messaging problem because you talked about the Joel Osteens of the world or even the Mark Wahlbergs of the world. Who do you think is more likely 
to convert the everyday person to love America and to fear God again? A Joel Osteen or a Mark Wahlberg type? I would argue that you need this in the pop culture zeitgeist. Yeah. It's not going to take a religious leader or some sort of apostle that's going to convert everyday Americans to start loving Americans again or go to church more often. It's not going to be a religious leader. You see the fastest growing religion in America these days is atheism yeah, and non, agnosticism, nuns, right? Yeah. And non-denominational or just non-believer. Mm, yes. Um, so we need to, kind of like what you're saying, we need to make loving America again and American values yes. and Judeo-Christian values pop culture and cool again. And until that's done, I think we're going to have this same conversation for years and yeah, years and to so come. My argument is that the American founding is the great rallying point. I think that it's so beautiful. It's so exceptional. It's so rare in human history. And it also, I think people yearn to actually love the place they live in. I know that's an unusual thing to say. I think people actually want an excuse to love America. And so I think the promise of the founding can be that great unifying. That you could disagree on tax policy, disagree on immigration, but let's at least agree that these founders were onto something very big, bold, and beautiful. Assessments like the one presented here presents us with a complex situation where the preservation of liberalism and social diversity in present-day America is potentially compromised in favor of a return to Christian traditions. What I anticipate from these individuals is an acknowledgement of the truth that America has become increasingly diverse and heterogeneous. These important aspects should also be taken into consideration, otherwise the entire discourse would be perceived as a mere pretense. I don't think we're past the tipping point. To the Andrew Tate part, I think that's a bad reason to convert to Islam. I don't think that's a good reason to convert to Islam, but because there's plenty of uncompromising Christian churches. But generally, yes, it is true that a lot of Christian denominations are becoming more like the world and not following the word. Happy to talk more about that if you want. But that, that is the question, is where is the West? And you kind of got to have to take a pulse. There's plenty of reasons for optimism. I'm seeing a kind of renewed sense of patriotism in certain sects. I'm seeing what we're doing at Turning Point USA. I'm seeing parents get more involved in school boards. At the same time, we're living through what Nietzsche predicted in the 1860s, 1870s, and 1880s, where he did not proclaim it, but he stated God is dead. And the next, and again, that's, it's misquoted because people think he was celebrating the, God, the death of God. He was not. What he was saying is that, hey, you in the West, if you are going to replace God with consumerism and the Industrial Revolution and hyper-individualism, be careful what's going to take its place. In concluding this analysis, I propose that Christianity should undergo a rebranding process that revolves around transparency and truthfulness. It is imperative to address the significant issues of sex abuse scandals, the erosion of faith in the church, and the tendency of Christians to compromise their principles for the sake of human interest. Christians need to stand firmly akin to Islam on the fundamental Abrahamic principles of belief in one God, ditching away in a trinity and absolute morality. The leniency that marked the Protestant Revolution and the reforms of Vatican II within Catholicism should be confronted directly. Young people seek authenticity and consistency and addressing these concerns will be crucial in appealing to them. I believe with all this, Christianity can get it foot, but for now, Islam is the best. Let's leave it right there, ladies and gentlemen. Please do like, share, and you know, subscribe to the channel. Until next time, assalamu alaikum.